Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everybody and thank you for joining today's webinar that will be focused on power management. This is the last webinar of a series of five webinars we held throughout the week. Um, I want to remain all attendees uh, to remind all attendees that this webinar was mainly designed for the participants in the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge, an initiative led by Efficiency for Access Coalition with support of Engineers Without Borders UK. Um, nonetheless, if you're not part of the Design Challenge, you're still welcome to listen to our two speakers today that I will introduce in a second. Throughout the webinar, please uh, do type the questions you have on the in the question box uh, that should be in the go to webinar window on the right of your screen. We will address them uh, at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. Um, and yeah, let me introduce today's speakers. So, We'll be hearing from Douglas and Harini. So Douglas has over six years experience working in the renewable energy industry, uh, primarily focusing on solar energy. He's an internationally trained renewable energy engineer with a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from Makerere University, a university participating in our competition and holding a postgraduate diploma diploma in uh, business administration from the Uganda Management uh, Institute. Currently, Douglas is the managing director uh, of Innovex Uganda, um, so a business that is transforming the distribution of off-grid solar energy using Internet of Things or IoT and digital tools. Um, Innovex uh, manufactures and distributes smart solar meters in five countries in the East African region. Douglas is also part of the board of the Ugandan Solar Energy Association and is driven by the dream of global access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy. Harini, that we've been um, listening to on Wednesday already and the, during the refrigeration webinar, um, has a strong background working in the energy storage space, having managed several academic and industrial research projects. She's completed a PhD in battery research at Imperial College London and she's currently the battery research lead at MCOPA Labs, the research and development arm of MCOPA Solar. And for those of you who don't know MCOPA Solar, um, it is a global leader in the PAYGO off-grid solar industry having connected so far over 750,000 households across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, well, now that I've introduced our two speakers, I will leave the floor for the interesting stuff. Um, and Douglas, please, um, you can start. Thanks. Well, thank you, Theo, for, for that well done introduction. Uh, I'm happy to, um, to be part of this. Um, Innovex is, is also part of the Efficiency for Access program. And uh, we're being funded to fine tune and improve our technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, power management um, is, is an interesting topic uh, because um, the key question we're trying to answer is, can we do more with the power that we're generating today? Uh, next slide. Next slide, okay. So Innovex, um, we, we started way back in 2015. We, this is interesting for us because we were just uh, graduates from the university uh, with a lot of experience in robotics and uh, embedded systems. So we got to build out our IoT platform for solar distributors in Uganda, uh, later on uh, expanding to five countries at the moment. So we, we have a B2B uh, IoT platform with more than a thousand smart meters installed. Uh, this basically remotely monitor performance of solar installations and solar equipment, reporting these to both the distributors, the end user, and in some cases, the manufacturers that work with. Uh, so we also have uh, AI and data algorithms that um, uh, in real time are able to report on performance and health of, of different solar components, the battery, uh, the panels, uh, production from the panels, as well as the load. Uh, next slide. 
the scope of my discussion is um, majorly power management. Uh, it's, it's going to be limited to, uh, to power use. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about uh, device to device communication. It's, it's a key aspect to managing power. Um, I'll talk about what is on the market, uh, the challenges, as well as the barriers to developing um, uh, or to, to the improvement of the solutions that are on the market. So I'll also speak about the enabling technologies for power management uh, in my presentation. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties. Douglas, are you still on the line? Great, so <laughs> it seems we lost one of our speakers. Um, I'm sorry to all of our audience. Um, if you can hold for a second. All right, M maybe... Can you, oh. can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes, thanks, Douglas. Hello. You can start again, yeah. I don't know what happened. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. So uh, the aspects of power management that I'll talk about uh, will range from uh, the efficiency of the solar equipment, um, the control of the power use, and also how data is, is, is being used to... Uh, to manage both the efficiency and also control uh, the usage of, of this equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at the market um, in terms of uh, uh, power management, I, I believe these are devices that most of us or some of us have interacted with, with before. Um, why why I, I chose to speak about uh, what's trending on you know the, the developed countries such as the smart home technologies is because um, when you look at what Africa needs at the moment, it's it's simply a copy and paste. What's what's happening on the on the market in the developed world? Uh, do that in Africa, but uh, the key aspect is is affordability. How are the people the low income? A population in Africa going to afford uh, these technologies. So um, looking at smart home technologies, I, I believe uh, these, these are things that each of us is aware of. Uh, the Google is, 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 is very dominant in this, Amazon, uh, Apple. And when you look at lighting, there's a lot of solutions for smart lighting, both the high end, such as the Philips Hue, uh, the TP-Link, and uh, the low end that are a bit affordable for the middle income, such as the lips bulbs. Um, uh, but moving this to the African markets, as, as you develop your challenge, what you should think about mostly is, is how are these going to be affordable? I mean, the, the, the cheapest uh, smart bulb goes for about $10. Uh, in terms of um, what people buy on the African market, uh, you cannot sell for a bulb for more than a dollar or two dollars. So affordability is very important, um, but what's happening on the modern market or on the developed countries is, I could say, relevant for, for what should happen in Africa if we can make it affordable. And in terms of appliances, there's a lot that is happening in the smart, in the smart appliances, um, looking at fridges, um, the ovens. So the question you should have on your mind is how do I adopt what's happening in Europe, what's happening in America, and apply it on the African market. Uh, of course, with aff affordability in mind. Uh, next slide. And uh, looking at the angle of power monitoring, so um, power monitoring and uh, data management uh, is, is, is an upcoming topic quite interesting because 
there is a huge gap uh, between what's happening at the end user side uh, and the distributor side. Um, the, the, one of the challenges of the solar industry you'll find is there's not much information on how users are interacting with products or how products perform, perform in real life. Um, and this, this has caused um, very many conflicts with very many distributors and of course their end users. Where you find um, batteries are installed uh, at the end, end user's uh, place, probably a home or a hospital, and these will only work for about six months and uh, they will not work anymore. So uh, remote monitoring, power monitoring device is, is an interesting market because uh, this is something new, probably about two, three years old. And there's a number of uh, initiatives uh, that have come up. Uh, a company such as Park Meter, operation in Kenya and Tanzania, they do uh, provide interesting remote monitoring solutions. And um, very many uh, are trying to build um, their own communication technologies. So they do have a device that sits on the solar system and connects to the internet, uh, probably via uh, an internet connection that could be provided by a router or ethernet. Uh, solar analytics uh, is another interesting technology that is uh, existing out of Australia. Uh, but like I'll talk about later, some of the challenges of these technologies is they have a big, um, uh, product market fit difference when it comes to the African market. Uh, Clear Blue Technologies is also doing a lot of work in remote monitoring. Uh, it's developed out of uh, the United States, but yet to be adopted for the African market. Uh, the rest are other examples you can look at um, um, of uh, other companies that are developing monitoring solutions for the African market. So. In, in this space, a, a typical monitoring device usually consists of a CT, a current transformer, uh, that will monitor the performance of, of, of a solar installation. Some of the challenges with these technologies that I'll talk about uh, are in the technology that uh, they are using at the moment. There is not much work that has been done in uh, DC power measurement, DC monitoring. So when you look at um, uh, the technologies in sensing uh, DC power, you have very few options for sensors to choose from. It's, it's one of the barriers to uh, developing some of the remote monitoring solutions for the solar industry on the African continent. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is a question to you. Uh, have you used any of these uh, smart devices in your homes? Uh, could move to the next slide. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, smart speakers, the smart lights. Uh, this, this is interesting. So uh, as, as you develop your solution or as you think about your solution, uh, it's simply about adapting what you have or what you have experienced to the African market uh, and making it affordable and more efficient to work on a solar system. Uh, next slide. So as, as you live, uh, you know, on a daily basis, why do you think you're spending most of your, your electricity, most energy? Uh, is it early in the morning taking a hot shower or late in the evening? Or are you spending a lot of time on TV, your smartphone or laptop? Or is it that you do a lot of cooking and probably you're powering a lot of equipment at your workplace? You could be running a workshop or uh, you're running a factory, which of those areas consumes uh, most power in your daily life? Next slide. Oh, interesting, electric cooking. Next slide. So, 
So um, when you look at the market uh, challenges, uh, I'm going to focus on four major challenges, uh, the market forecast, the technology, uh, local application, and the cost. Uh, next slide. So starting off with the market forecast. So um, it's, 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 it's true that a lot of R&D, a lot of product development is usually focused to the, to the high-end developed market. Uh, there is not very many initiatives to develop for the bottom of the pyramid market, uh, which is typical of, of an African market. And um, you, you'll find that some of the investment that is geared towards developing for the African market is, is mostly the grants. There is not a lot of private, compared to the developed uh, markets, it's, there's not a lot of private uh, money going into development of products for the low-end markets. So there's that mis mismatch of investments, which usually, usually have cycles of five years. And develop, uh, investing in Africa is, is a long-term initiative that would probably look at uh, seven to 10 years uh, for investors to get their money out. And um, for most of the low income markets on the, on the continent, uh, reaching them in terms of distribution is, 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 uh, is quite hard. And sometimes um, also collecting the money, uh, the payment channels are not yet that developed. Uh, mobile money is, is, is proving a good solution, but it's yet to reach out to the masses uh, in some of the African countries. Next slide. And in terms of the technology, uh, when you look at Africa, Africa is largely a mobile only continent. We get internet on our phones. Uh, we do a lot with our phones. So, um, most of the products that are being developed are not able to uh, communicate or connect to the internet simply because they either ethernet uh, connect or they connect via Wi-Fi. And um, sometimes the question of energy consumption in Africa is, is a question of uh, should I power a fridge to keep vaccines fresh? Uh, should I power lights to provide lighting for schools? As compared to Powering the next, you know, big screen, and um, uh, in terms of technology, another challenge is interfacing with some of the products that are developed. It's hard to uh, to interface with them. You'll find that the user experience is not that good. Uh, the causes of some of these challenges te technologically is because uh, some of the technologies are in their early stage. Uh, it really takes time to develop some of these technologies. I believe M. Copper will talk about that then uh, there is a huge difference in infrastructure in Africa. In terms of communication, you find we mostly use uh, the mobile phones, whereas the markets where these solutions are developed, they're using uh, landlines or internet is provided via Wi-Fi. Wi and the distribution is definitely difficult because we do not have developed infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and in terms of costs, uh, like I said, Africa is a mobile only continent. If you build a product that feeds or grows off the mobile infrastructure, it will be good for the African market. And uh, there's a lot of difference in the demographics of different communities in Africa, the psychographics. So it becomes uh, very complicated for you to customize a product for a broader market. And um, I think uh, this is not new. The level of development in very many African communities is not that high. You'll find there's huge difference in terms of education and the level of awareness. Next slide, please. So uh, the current demand uh, for power management, uh, when you look at um, uh, the, the value chain in, in the off-grid industry, there's a lot of need in power management in the after sales uh, market. So usually after the companies make a sale, they usually have warranties or they have uh, contracts uh, to provide maintenance to their customers. This usually go up to five years, three to five years for some of them. So there's a lot of need uh, that uh, these products are efficient or that uh, they're managed well or they're using electricity the right way so that the batteries do not die uh, over that five year period. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, the enabling technologies you could think about um, would range from smart meters, data analytics, machine learning, uh, blockchain, and internet of things. In the interest of time, I'll simply talk about blockchain here. So what we do as Innovex with blockchain, currently we, we, we work with manufacturers distributing solar maize mills on the continent. And we are now developing a blockchain that will enable end users pay for the equipment on, on a pay per use model. So if a piece of equipment is going to, to last about 10,000 cycles, they'll be paying each cycle of use as opposed to paying an upfront fee. So that is how blockchain can power any solution that you can think about in developing for the African market uh, with you know, the aspect of affordability in mind. Next slide, please. So how these connect to the SDGs, you uh, definitely SDG number seven, uh, affordable and clean energy. And of course, uh, most importantly, will be promoting education. And in terms of gender equality, uh, the people most affected on the continent from use of unclean energies you'll find are either women, or young children. So by promoting clean and affordable energy, you definitely are promoting SDG number five. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so when you look at the size of the market, uh, we have more than 121 million households without access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, depending on the kind of business model that you think about, uh, we have about uh, 20 million households reported that can afford a solar system of 50 watt peak and above. So depending on your business model, you will be able to come down to um, a, a target market uh, for your solution. And across the five countries that Innovex operates, we have more than 3,000 solar agents operating in these markets. Uh, next slide, please. So the applications you could think about, I think about schools. Schools are a huge market for solar technologies in Africa, health centers, uh, businesses that run off solar energy. Uh, a case of, 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 of Sub-Saharan Africa, you'll find it's reported that 600 million people don't have access to energy. So uh, powering uh, equipment, powering machines to run a business is a huge market for, uh, for off-grid equipment and systems. Um, next slide. Uh, as I conclude, of course, uh, this is one of the sayings that motivates me and it goes that Stone Age did not end because uh, we ran out of stones. Uh, we, try, we simply transition to better solutions. The same opportunity lies before us with efficiency and clean energy. Uh, and um, I, my closing remarks, um, we have close to a billion people reported not to have access to energy. And some of the, the reasons they don't have uh, energy is because they cannot afford it. So should we wait uh, 50 years uh, for them to be able to afford uh, the high end um, uh, equipment, the high-end appliances, or should we adopt these appliances uh, to their needs and help them afford uh, these appliances? So as I close, uh, let's think uh, more about building for the markets that uh, should have the right to afford uh, this equipment and appliances, and uh, we make energy access a right to everyone in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas, and thanks for these inspiring um, uh, um, concluding notes. Um, I want to remind all attendees that you can ask questions throughout the webinar in the question box uh, in the go to webinar window, and we'll address these uh, towards the end of this session uh, during the Q&A session. Um, Harini, the floor is not now yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Douglas, as well, for your very interesting presentation. Um, great, I'm ready to begin. If you, yeah, thank you. And the next one, thank you. Um, great, so um, apologies for those who um, dialed in on Wednesday, but I feel that to talk, oh, well, 
Thank you. Um, but to talk about power management at MCOPA, we, we first need to address, you know, the, the kind of business and the business model and um, to give some context. So this kind of um, sum, sums up for you guys how the business model work really, which is that um, at MCOPA, if you were um, one of our customers, you'd give us a $30 deposit um, to get our, one of our uh, classic systems that you see in a couple of sites. And then using um, mobile money, for example, in Kenya and Pesa, you'd be paying 50 cents a day um, to repay you. You pay 50 cents a day until you repay the, your device. Uh, and 50, 50 cents a day is also what we um, we realize our customers would spend on um, on kerosene. So you're you're never really paying for the electricity that you're using, but you're repaying that loan that we effectively gave you. And we should see repayment um, in about a year or 14 months or so. Uh, and that's pretty much the kind of model we apply for um, a lot of um, our as in key offering. Uh, next slide, please. So, what the, the way we see it at, at MCOPA is kind of looking at the whole customer journey. So, once we get a customer on, on board with us, uh, with one device, what we really want to be doing is, um, is help them have access to whether it's other appliances or other services, like um, cash loan or cleaner cooking solution or fertilizers um, and this is kind of what what their journey um, looks like in an ideal case scenario where after joining in you suddenly are starting to develop a credit rating with us so if you're repaying on time means that you'd be eligible um, so yeah you can see cash loans for paying for example school fee fees or if suddenly you're stalling on your payments, we have the ability um, to enable customers to delay payments um, and start at a later date. But then you're also available for upgrade, as we see here, for, um, for TVs and such after about a year. Uh, but also later on, other appliances like smartphone. So why am I talking about this? Um, it's because for all each of these upgrades or add-ons, um, what we are really what we are really dependent on is that initial core unit that we gave. So if we upgrade, we're going to change that unit. But fundamentally, the way we manage uh, that unit, whether it's the kind of solar panel, our own communication system, and the battery, is key. And any failure on kind of um, those ends would lead to MCOPA not receiving payments anymore. Um, but more importantly, customers not having access um, to their appliances and to lights anymore, which leads to them either having to wait, um, well, either having to go to shops, which might be really far away, um, to, to kind of get a diagnosis and get replacements. Um, and, and we just don't want that kind of downtime. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this kind of gives you um, the whole kind of variety of core device offering uh, that we have. So we have our classic device that we started selling when the company started in, in 2012. But then we have um, various size of TVs, but also solar fridge um, that we started retailing since, um, since 2018. So this was just to give you like, an idea of like the increase, um, the incremental changes that we've had um, in our devices and therefore in the way we had to adapt in terms of power management. As chronolo chronologically, you could, also, um, you could also put the kind of sizes of panel and batteries and they will be um, increasing in, this, in a similar fashion. Next slide, please. Great, so what are the real drawbacks and design problems um, that we have in the current solutions um, in this space? So I'd say there's, uh, there's the quality of data. So, so devices might be connected, um, I'm talking about MCOPA, but also uh, other players in the, in the industry. Um, they might be connected to platforms where they'll be sending data, 
Um, but of course, missing data is inevitable in the sense that um, your device might have died and and then suddenly you would have lost about a day's worth of data or a couple of hours worth of data. Um, but also the kind of quality and granularity of the data collected from these systems aren't ideal uh, where you'd be, you'd be missing uh, a lot of information data that you could have used to build um, these algorithms to try to understand what's happening um, in your system. Um, other big issue is battery quality, uh, and I will come back to that later in the presentation, but um, quality and consistency between um, battery batches vary a lot, uh, which makes it really difficult um, for the off-grid players to, to kind of know exactly what to expect in terms of return rates and failure rates, etc. Um, and, and we're working on that on improving uh, our quality standards. Uh, but I think there's still a lot more to be done. Um, and therefore, because of battery quality, one of the biggest issues is premature degradation of, of your system that, as I mentioned um, in the previous slide, leads to customers having to um, have downtime and also the hassle of swapping. Um, and another thing that's um, important to keep in mind is, of course, oversizing of battery and panel uh, for some products. Like I'm thinking here about fridges, as um, fridges have to be on 24-7. Uh, what the last thing you want is um, for the battery to run out of its juice because um, then you'd be spoiling all the food or um, you, it would have an impact to kind of, um, I guess, the medical uh, chemicals they'll be keeping in the fridge. So what the safest thing to do is to oversize so there's enough um, reserve that the issue can be fixed. But obviously that comes at a cost um, to MCOPA and the customer. Um, and so it's a, it's a compromise. Next slide, please. Um, so how, how do we address these challenges at MCOPA? So um, as I mentioned, we, we're one of those companies who have one, a, a platform, so we call it MCOPANET. And MCOPANET um, essentially communicates with each individual device out there in the field. So we have over uh, 750,000 households connected now. So those are millions of data points coming daily. So um, it depends from device to device, but we tend to collect a data point either every hour or every 15 minutes, um, which is, um, which is a lot, but also very little compared to, I guess, other industries. I'm thinking here, say, about an electric vehicle that would be sending, well, collecting data, you know, in the order of, of, of seconds rather than, um, than minutes. Um, but yes, so we're collecting all this data on MCOPANET that enable us to be, to look at how our devices are performing, but also are being able to look at credit data and also any other kind of error uh, and devices playing up um, and sending us those error messages. Next slide, please. So uh, here's, so we can, we can kind of split remote monitoring into two. Um, so remote monitoring is important from an individual device perspective, as you can see here. Um, we have one, so this is a fridge, um, this is a fridge connect, a solar fridge connected device. And you can see, we just, you know, we can see that every day it's being charged and then held at a, a fully charged state and then discharged as um, the sun goes off. And having, um, in the, being able to look at individual devices is really important in terms of troubleshooting um, and providing this kind of you know, catered personal service to each customer. Uh, next slide. But com the combination of all those individual data enable us to do population data mapping. Um, and again, I've, I've shown this on Wednesday for those of you who were here, but um, so this is an example of that. So this is on a pilot of solar fridges, uh, 43 devices. And um, what we wanted to see is like, okay, on average, how does our fridges operate? So you have here kind of, you know, the mean, um, but also the different confidence band of like where the customers would fall into. And what you see is that indeed, 
you know, during the night times it discharges and then as we saw for the individual device, it charges when the sun is out and then east get fully charged until the sun goes down. But um, more importantly, what we can see is kind of the depth of discharge of the battery and yes, the confidence level. So where can we optimize thing? Um, and here it does look like it is, you know, very much so oversized. But the reason for that, as I mentioned, is um, to allow a safety reserves in case something goes wrong. Um, but these kind of population um, information is what enable us to um, to feed that information back, I guess, to our product design team and to design our products to cater our customers' need. Next slide, please. Um, and in terms of other technical solutions, so um, there's quite a lot going on in this graph, but um, in this sorry slide, but um, we are trying to uh, understand um, our devices and our batteries better. So we had a project in partnership with Oxford University uh, that was aiming to use our device data to build state of health and remaining useful life algorithms. So in terms of state of health and remaining useful life, so state of health is more, is a diagnosis, is asking your battery, how are you today? Whereas remaining useful life is a prediction, is asking you how are you going to be doing in a couple of months, a couple of years time. And both of those things are important. So here what you see is um, the graph that I've put here is um, you see a device that's being switched on and then over a very short period of time really you see its state of health declining at, uh, at a really fast rate. And obviously this is a faulty device but um, this kind of, um, so we used our current data and um, we built these algorithms in partnership with Oxford and they enable us to do very crude approximations. If you go to the next slide. So like I said, our data is collected either a data point every hour or every 15 minutes, which is not a lot. So a lot of information is missing. So we won't be able to say looking at a device hey, like this battery is going to die in two months and two weeks. What we're going to be able to do is have this kind of traffic light system. So here what you see on the top graph is like you have a device that has a rather fast um, degradation rate, and but it is fine, but they suddenly enter this orange zone, which is it means it's dying. So we just kind of define three buckets, and the bucket number one, which is fine, is if the battery's state of health is okay today and if um, and if um, it's going to be okay in six months time and then it enters the dying zone if the state of health is okay today but it looks like it's going to be uh, dying in six months time and then well the the dead uh, one is, well, the state of health is not okay today and um, it is below uh, threshold. Here we kind of set the threshold arbitrarily to 50% state of charge, but you can you can adapt it in depending on, um, on what your kind of end of life um, cutoff is uh, for your system. Uh, and yes, and then the second graph at the bottom is pretty much that you see that a device is dying and then suddenly it just jumps over to the next one is like, okay, here, it just reached 50% state of health, it's dead, it, it, it just it should have been replaced. Um, so, so these already, these kind of crude approximations um, with um, good error estimates enable MCOPA to start understanding how, um, how the quality of, uh, I guess, the batteries that are incoming and that we are putting out are but also enable us to make a prediction in terms of, oh, what, you know, uh, can we give this person another loan, say, for uh, an upgrade uh, within the within this time frame, or do we need to put in the cost of a battery replacement if we want to do these kind of thing? But also, um, like I mentioned before, uh, we're working on implementing this in these algorithms so we can use them for like troubleshooting as well in the future. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to put a quick um, plug in here for, in terms of understanding batteries. Um, so I feel like we talk a lot about energy storage and how 
um, you know, you you for for all these upgraded appliances, you need a combination of of solar and storage. But what's really important to understand in the wider context um, of this market is that you have you have a lot of lithium-ion battery manufacturer, and lithium-ion batteries tend to be the go-to solution now for most off-grid supplies. There's still some using lead acid, um, but there is a clear transition to a lithium-ion. Uh, but when, while you you probably see here a few names that you recognize, like Tesla, or Panasonic, etc. Um, these are not suppliers that the off-grid sector has access to. Um, those tier one suppliers will be supplying tier one um, electric car manufacturers. And already there's a shortage of tier one suppliers for electric car manufacturers, so they're starting to work with some tier two as well. Uh, meaning that a lot of us have to work with tier three suppliers, and once you progressively go down the tiers, it's really hard to know what's good and what's bad. So I think as an industry overall, what we really are focusing on is setting standards. Uh, what should be the standards and the kind of, you know, tools used to um, to understand the quality of these batteries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, which kind of bring me to the um, end of my presentation. So in terms of direction, um, and COPA and the industry is taking, I guess, uh, in this field, so we can see that we have larger, we see larger and larger devices um, and appliances being brought to market. And um, the impact on that, as I said, is going to be we'll have to provide uh, larger and larger backup um, storage uh, so these appliances can be used when the sun is off. Um, so, so really, um, the challenge is going to be on that combination of um, of battery plus uh, plus solar. Um, also, the markets are expanding, so we're going um, we're seeing customers going from people who hadn't had access to electricity using kerosene and candles, um, you know, joining Mcopa to now different markets such as Nigeria, where your typical customer will have access to electricity. But what you're trying to um, what you're trying to displace there is the diesel generator uh, that people use um, when they're experiencing downtime on the grid, which is a lot. So challenges are on kind of customer needs and the type of appliances um, that's going to be offered. And um, and like I mentioned, if the if the battery is the heart of the system, your battery management system is going to be the brain, and working on better battery management system is is crucial in terms of extending their lifetime um, but but also understanding them and being able to do all this predictive work to fundamentally avoid any downtime um, so in terms of MCOPA so we are funded uh, by efficiency for access on developing this smart battery solution um, to improve our remote monitoring but also to you know to work toward having uh, these longer lasting batteries in the field. Um, and, and so that whole project is around uh, smart monitoring uh, of our current solutions. Um, next slide. Great, um, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. So um, please feel free to ask questions. And if you can think of questions later on, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much, Harini, very insightful. Um, presentation. So we're now going to move to the Q&A question. And I'd like to start with a question we received from the audience um, about, so basically you, you collect all this data um, and, and does the data collected feed into educating the customer on how to use um, and optimize uh, the battery, but also the appliances? And if you have concrete examples of it, it would be great. Maybe yes. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, so we we actually do that as Innovex. Uh, when you look at our business model, we we provide uh, both a product as well as a service. So this is something we call the uh, the lifetime service. Uh, a typical uh, solar business um, usually is does not have a highly technical person to uh, to provide. Um, 
or to interpret uh, technical information. So as, as Innovex, uh, that's one of the services that we are currently providing to the solar companies. So still, uh, we're limited to the B2B model. We do not yet have a direct interface with the end user. So uh, we are supporting the solar businesses um, um, uh, better or enhance their after sales support. So we inform them about what's happening on ground uh, from what the smart meters are telling us, and then they take action uh, on the client side. Thanks. Uh, Harini, um, maybe? Yeah, uh, of course. So, so in terms of educating the customers, so um, here's the thing, like I said, um, I think we, we we still experience some issues with our with our data. So we we won't necessarily do individual customer education, but um, looking at um, population level data, what we would be seeing is like okay, in terms of operating conditions, or um, um, or for example, in terms of leaving, uh, you know, like where should a device be placed etc um start seeing information so so the way we feed that back into customers would be through text messages or um or ringing them um if we see something on an individual level but to give you a concrete example uh, one of the things we have seen is that uh radios and torches might so radios actually more than torches would see like early sign of battery failures and we couldn't quite understand what what was going on um, and people might be using it when they're working outdoors and leaving it in direct sunlight uh, that would have a big impact on battery life so kind of educating customers was like okay so like try not to a charge it in direct uh, like absolutely don't charge it in direct sunlight as that's a safety risk uh, and we put appropriate cutoff for that but uh, in terms of using your radio please try not to put it in direct sunlight because that's going to um, reduce the lifetime of your of your device. So for, for things like that, yes, but it would be more through text messages. Thanks a lot. Um, next question. Uh, so Harini, you mentioned um, that it was hard for, for uh, solar home system providers to access uh, tier one uh, battery suppliers. Um, so for example, Tesla, etc. cetera. Um, but obviously, um, aren't there some specificities um, to the African market in terms of battery? I'm, I'm thinking temperature, I'm thinking uh, conditions, anything. And um, would be interesting to see also on the other side, what are the specificities of the off-grid market in terms of battery need? And, and would really yeah. these tier one uh, suppliers uh, be adapted? And uh, I'm sure Douglas, you'll have some insights as well. So maybe Harini, go first. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, in terms of lithium-ion batteries, we kind of bucket all lithium-ion batteries together, but there is a wide range of chemistries. So, typically, um, I'm just going to give the acronyms, uh, acronyms here, but um, typically in an electric vehicle, what type of chemistry you see is NMC or NCA, um, etc. So, these are cobalt-based uh, chemistries, but what you and and they're necessary because you want um, really high energy density batteries, but the kind of requirements um, for the African market is energy density is not necessarily uh, one of the things you optimize for. What you want is lower degradation at, high, at elevated temperature, you want um, increased safety, and you want a long cycle um, life. And for that purpose, actually, LFP, so it's lithium ion phosphate chemistry, is quite um, is quite suitable. So not all those um, top top tier manufacturers produce LFP. They do produce NMC or NCA though, um, which are which are not not suitable uh, for the African market. It's just that they require. Um, an even more sophisticated uh, battery management system um, in order to manage them. Uh, and fundamentally, I think that's the key thing, is like you can, you could technically use any lithium-ion battery, um, although you've been limited by their cycle number, but what, what's really, really important is how you manage them using your BMS. So, um, so I'd say there's, there's, um, those tier one supplier battery could be used, but we don't have access to it because, um, because they're in shortage. And also from a price point perspective, they, they just, we, it's not a feasible option right now. 
Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, uh, Douglas. Okay. Do you want to answer as well? Yeah. So uh, typically, when when a battery is brought to market, uh, it, it is expected to work. Um, but uh, what we have learned um, over time is, I think, as uh, as Arini was was saying, we're not sure about the tier three. So there's been a lot of battery failures uh, most of the time. And um, it's, it's the typical problem that you will find, we find with uh, on, on our platform with most of the installations, it usually starts with the battery. So in terms of uh, the lithium ion batteries, um, so as, as part of the efficiency of access, we, we recently developed our hardware to be able to, our smart meters to be able to, uh, to report on ambient and battery temperatures. Uh, so we already have about uh, 300 installations to be done in Kenya. Um, um, and this is a project where they are recycling uh, batteries from, uh, from electric vehicles. So when batteries are done with electric vehicles, usually they have a couple of years to go before they die. Uh, so we, we, we are studying this. We're trying to understand how do these batteries perform in their second life. Um, so it's, it, in terms of the topics, uh, when the batteries are, sup are supplied, they, they're expected to work under a certain range of temperatures. But um, in Africa, it, 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 it's, it's not, um, we, we are yet to understand how the humidity, how the temperature affects battery performance. Because even when you look at batteries that power street lighting uh, on the market, um, street lights uh, typically in Uganda die within eight months, and it's usually the batteries that you know die off. Uh, yet uh, the the lab tests are reported as something different. So in terms of field performance, uh, we do not have as much data uh, at the moment. But like I, I, I said in my presentation, uh, data monitoring, remote monitoring, is is going to be a key element in understanding field performance of most of these. Thanks a lot for your answers. Um, very interesting. Uh, question linked to you, so Douglas, you just touched base on, on recycling used um, batteries. Um, so ca can you explain a bit more how your work is um, helping reducing e-waste, which is obviously a, a big issue. So e-waste being um, uh, waste that comes from uh, electric devices such as solar panels, but also batteries. Um, can you you tell us a bit more about how your work helps reducing um, that waste eventually? Oh, yes, um, and maybe in terms of e-waste specifically, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the electronic components of the solar system and the batteries. Yeah, so um, I, in, there is usually not uh, a plan for, uh, for electronics that, you know, are designed for five, uh, three, ten years. Interestingly, this is a question most of us have not thought about before. What what happened to your sm your first phone, the first phone you held? Uh, maybe it wasn't a smartphone, but uh, what or where did you throw it? Uh, do you have any idea where it is? So bring that to the solar market. Um, we pump out um, probably uh, billions of, of, of solar products on the market each year. Uh, these are maybe designed to last to last five years uh, for the batteries, about ten years for the inverters and charge controllers. So the question of what 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 happens to these electronics after is not yet clear. But um, what we 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 believe um, uh, data and uh, remote monitoring will do is we will have a clear understanding of of when a piece of equipment is is, is supposed to be disposed of and. Um, we will be able to, to plug into uh, recyclers that, um, that are focused on ele electronic waste, uh, battery waste. So we, we, we see that as, as a key plug-in to, um, to, to, uh, to sustainability, especially for the environment. In, in terms of lithium-ion batteries, um, uh, it's, the, the electric car industry usually demands for high-quality batteries, but uh, like I said, uh, when you know they they reach uh, their design life, which is usually about um, three three hundred thousand miles, uh, it's not because they are dead. It's just because uh, for the electric car application, uh, it requires a certain quality. 
So um, there's very many initiatives. Uh, that, that one I talked about was in Kenya, but in Uganda what's happening is there's very, there's very many startups that are working on recycling these batteries for, uh, for motorcycles. Uh, there's one in Rwanda that I also know about. Uh, these are uh, electric motorbikes. Uh, they want to use, uh, you know, the second or the, uh, the second grade batteries that are from the car markets. They're still good quality and they can still serve another four or five years. Thanks. Harini, do you want to add anything? Um, I think that was a, a pretty complete answer. I, I'd say that essentially having, um, so having smart monitoring kind of enables acting, um, acting also to, to remove batteries from the field and that's what we're hoping uh, to do with smart batteries. Uh, as it's done, we, you know, we, we have e-waste partners who we send all our electronic waste um, to and any failed battery that's returned to us we would dispose of from our customers. But obviously what you don't want is a system to die in the field um, and for that battery to be left there, you want it to be disposed appropriately. And I think that's what that's kind of the next stage um, that we want to tackle is like how do we encourage people to return um, failed items so we can dispose of it properly. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry for all the other questions. We're now reaching the end of our webinar. Um, Harini Douglas, do you have a last word to say? I guess, um, like I mentioned, please do get in touch if you have questions. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward, um, looking forward to see the projects that come out of the challenge. <laughs> I, I'm also definitely looking forward to, uh, to the ideas that uh, most of the students have. I mean, we, we came up with the, the idea of remote monitoring for solar solutions as we were coming out of the university. So it's, it's an exciting moment for, for the participants. Uh, I mean, this, this could become a business for you in the future. And there's, there's a lot of interest in the off-grid industry because we actually have a potential to leapfrog uh, the need to, uh, to distribute high, uh, high, high power lines all over Africa. So it's quite ex exciting and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. And in case you have any questions, please do reach out. And thank you. Thank you very much and thanks to all um, attendees. Um, so this was the last webinar of our technological week. Um, thanks to you two for today. Uh, to all attendees, keep an eye out for an announcement on an additional webinar focused on business models and end users that will take place in November to be announced soon. Thank you very much um, and have a lovely day everybody.